Uh, next up is uh, Shetil from Nix. He will talk about some cool stuff. Yep. All right, welcome. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, and I'm glad to be here. Uh, I have attended a number of these meetings, sometimes not standing here, but um, when I think I have something interesting to tell you, I'll, I'll try to pop up on stage. Um, this is something a little bit different from what I'm usually talking about, and I'll explain in a minute. Um, you, you, most of you know who I am. Uh, I run the Norwegian IX, Nixt, and cooperate with NetNode quite closely. Um, on this, and I've been to a number of these meetings and other meetings, and I've been quite active in this industry for more than 30 years uh, with EuroX, been on the board, been chairman of the board there, and a number of other things. But what most of you don't know, probably, is that at the same time, I've had a position as a technical expert in uh, what's called intelligence oversight in Norway. We have a parliamentary committee, I'm not part of that, I'm part of their support team. But that, that committee is doing oversight over the uh, secret services, uh, which is the uh, intelligence service, it's the military intelligence service, the police security service, and the national security authority, and, and some other smaller entities. Some of you might know these services, one way or another, I won't go into that. But I've been working for them for more than 20 years. And in Norway, you have similar types of organizations as, as I work for. Sekerets og Integritetsutsnemden and Statens Inspektion for Forsvarsunderrettelsesverksamhet. The last one is hard to pronounce, even for Norwegian. But So we have the same same organizations in Sweden, so you can reference to, to what they're doing. And we're cooperating with these uh, organizations as well, uh, uh, within our limits. And um, the committee that I work for, we produce annual reports, and some special reports now and then. And what is special about this is our reports are all public and unclassified. Of course, there's a lot of things we can't write about when it's unclassified, but well, it's what it is. We do also cooperate quite a lot with other countries, like the UK, Netherlands, that have similar, and, and Denmark, that have similar law and similar organization of both secret services and uh, oversight. So it's a, actually an international field, although it's very much national secrecy involved. So why I'm here on stage. Uh, in Norway, we had a new law for the military intelligence back in 2021. And it one of the interesting things is it has a lot of details. It went from eight paragraphs, saying you could do whatever you like, as long as it's not in Norway, uh, and now it's almost 90 paragraphs, and details their methods, which used to be secret. If I had written what's now in the public law five years ago, they would put me in jail. So this is a ch big change in Norway, so the intelligence service is much more open. And one of the thing that, things that are included is, in this law is a new method, which is a bulk cable interception, um, where they're allowed to tap into the communication that crosses the border between Norway and, well, mostly Sweden, then, but also some other countries. And it's supposed to be used for military intelligence, um, and just in very, very specific, for very specific purposes. And like in Sweden, 15 years ago, when you got your FRA log. Uh, it was a, has been a long public debate. It's not over yet. Uh, and there's also a lot of public information about this. Uh, we, I was here in Stockholm 10 years ago, almost, and talked to uh, uh, some of the uh, people in Riksdagen about the, the Swedish law uh, to prepare for what was we knew would be coming in Norway. So we're 15 years behind and we try to learn from the experiences you've had over those 15 years. But, um, well, good things for us. Um, uh, so I'm here to talk to you about this new method, simply because it will impact all of you that does business in Norway, and many of you do. And if, uh, if you don't do business there, you might travel to Norway, and then your traffic might be affected as a private person, so it's good to know. So, and I'm also here to get some feedback on 
the presentation as such or the topic. Uh, of course, there's a lot of things I can't talk about. Uh, apologies for that, but you have to talk to someone um, that uh, kind of classifies these things to, to change that. But I'll try to answer questions as far as I can. And I would love to hear experiences and comments from, from you here in Sweden on the subject. So the, the presentation now starts then with, with this um, fairly long description of a, of a long name, facilitated collection. The name facilitated is because someone has to facilitate for this to happen. The Secret Service is not going out with their own equipment and, and tapping onto the cables. It's the owners of the cables and systems that has to do it. But let, let's uh, dive into it. First of all, what is bulk collection? Um, it is when you tap into a communication link and you collect all the data on the link. You might not store everything, but you collect it all. There's no, you, you, you don't really discriminate, you just pull it all in and, and then you look at it. And the, the problem is that you, you know that most of what you're collecting is not interesting, but you don't know right now what is of interest and what is not. Because it's only when things happen that you know what is interesting and you want to roll back the time, so to speak, look at what happened yesterday, two weeks ago, a year ago. Then you know what you're interested in and you know what was not interesting. But at the time of collection, that is unknown. That's why you collect it all. So it's obvious, uh, at least in our uh, world, that such a bulk collection will contain a lot of personal and maybe also sensitive information. It's difficult to, to avoid if you collect all communication crossing a border. And um, the thing is that this kind of bulk collection is common in Europe today. As a, there was a public debate in Sweden. There was a public debate in the Netherlands uh, about this. Uh, Denmark has such a system. Uh, not officially, but they have. You have seen that in, in the press because the, the head of the military intelligence was put in jail and the former um, defense minister is, is charged with things. So, and the same with the UK. Officially, the UK don't have this system, but they have 50 people controlling it and they have annual reports saying that this works very well, but officially they don't have it. So, <laughs> so that, that's, that's this very strange world. But... Um, there has been a number of rulings in the EU court and the European Court for Human Rights to kind of um, limit the scope and limit the damages, if you will, of these type of operations. And there are four fairly, I wouldn't say famous, but four most important cases. as Big Brother Watch and Privacy International versus the UK, and also Centrum for Visa uh, versus Sweden and La Quadrature du Net versus France. Those four cases have kind of set the scene of how these kind of operations must be set up to meet the requirements in the Charter for Human Rights here in Europe, European Charter for Human Rights, which all European countries are <coughs> bound to follow. And this has um, uh, then set up a flurry of activities in many European countries to change the laws, including here in Sweden, there is now a, a, a commission working on adjusting the Swedish law to be in, in tune with the rulings from these European courts. And it's the same in Norway. Our law is, is just two years old, but uh, the final paragraph is not yet set. It's to be revised this, this spring, uh, also to be in, in tune with these rulings. So this is kind of what is bulk collection and what is the framework. So. But uh, what about Norway? <coughs> we have this extremely long uh, description of what it says. This is the official English name. It's called Tilrettelagt Inhenting in Norwegian, which most of you will probably understand, uh, or TI for short, and I'll use the TI term, um, not to use more than my allocated 30 minutes. And it's part of the new law. Um, and the, the qu key question is, who must do this facilitation? And there is... Uh, the laws, uh, this law of military intelligence leans on the Electronic Communication Act, so that all providers covered by that act, which is, is everyone having services to the Norwegian public, and they add 
and providers of internet-based communications or messaging services available to the public in Norway. So if you are a company that supplies Norwegian citizens in Norway with digital services, uh, this law applies to you. And that your, your, all your servers or your equipment might be somewhere else, um, in a cloud, in a data center in China, whatever, but you will still be covered by this law. But of course, this will mostly affect uh, the service providers here up in the Nordics. But, um, but as most of you know, there's a lot of uh, companies that work in Norway and Sweden and Denmark, so they will be, be covered by this. Um, so yeah, it will provide us of public uh, digital services. It's an emphasis on public. If you have a private company that has your internal network crossing the borders, that will not be part of this law at the moment. Might be in the future, but not now. So how should we control this? Uh, because that's my job. My job is not making this system happen or, or, or building it or using it. My job is to uh, make sure that we, from a technical perspective, are able to control what is going on. So I have a staff of, we're six in the technology field and uh, 11 lawyers. Uh, so uh, we're gonna use our combined resources to then dive in and, and control this. Not all of us will work with this full time, but that's the, that's the amount of people we've got at the moment. Uh, and it is a big system to understand and control, uh, especially if we wanna do the control very well, uh, but uh, that's a separate problem. We, we base our control on these requirements from the European Court of Human Rights, and there's two of them that is important for us. The first of them, and maybe most important, is that there's end-to-end -end safeguards, meaning that all parts of this uh, process should have a safeguard. And um, so it goes from uh, uh, start, where you, before you even do the, the, uh, the wiretap, so to speak, someone has to oversee that during the operation, check that everything is as it should be, and then afterwards, how do they use the data they have collected? Who do they share it with? Is it within the law? And there's also another uh, ruling saying that it should be several independent control bodies, not only one. And um, it means that we have to have someone else but us to do this. And in Norway, it's a special court that has been appointed to decide what is allowed and not allowed. So they will be the first one to, to do the rulings, and they will set the limits. So the, 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 um, the court might say, OK, you can tap into this digital service for this period of time, and you're, you're allowed to store these kind of data, and you are allowed to use it only for these purposes. And then we will come in afterwards and look at the operation at it, as it's running, to see are they within the, this, this, these limits, and also afterwards, how do they use it, how do they share it, do they delete it when they are supposed to delete it. That will be our, some of our tasks. And since this might be a lot of data, uh, it might also be a lot of things to look at. And uh, the, the price tag is uh, approximately 1,100 million Norwegian kroners. That is the price tag set on the system to set it up and run it for the first year. The operation cost after that is not disclosed, um, but that, that, that's kind of how big the system is. You get a lot of hardware, you can em employ a lot of people for that kind of money. They, they say officially that they're going to use 100 people approximately to operate this service when it's operational. So when we're only 17, we might have a lot of running to do. So, that, that's how we plan to do it. And then uh, I th thought I should tell you a little bit how this system is supposed to work. This is something special because uh, when you go to other countries and look at what is public information about these systems, sometimes you have a little bit of information, like in the Netherlands, there is uh, well, a fair amount of information out there. But except from the Netherlands and Norway, and a little bit from Sweden, there's not much information in the public domain about how these systems are supposed to work. So I thought this would be of interest just to show what, what, what they are thinking of, at least, of how this should work. 
Um, what I'm now presenting is based on the public works before the law was passed, and then, of course, adjusted as the law was passed. So this is all public, and the presentation itself was actually made before the law was pushed before Parliament, so it uh, should be fairly safe. And, um, of course, this is about communication between then Norway and the rest of the world, and uh, communication crossing the border. This is a challenge in itself, because if you looked at the uh, SUNET network that Börje showed, you, showed us a few minutes ago, you would see that there was many connections to Norway. And the fastest way from south to north in Norway is through Sweden, with car and on, on the digital platforms. So there's a lot of networks in Norway that when you have traffic to the northern part of Norway, you go through Sweden. Uh, and that is not border crossing traffic per se, because it crosses into Sweden and then back again. The end user is not abroad. But, but the traffic crosses the border physically, out and back in. And this is a problem that the, the Secret Service is not allowed to look at that traffic, so they have to remove it somehow. And well, let, we'll dive into that a little bit. So the the owner or operator of this communication link. And a communication link might be a cable, cable system, a fiber system, might be a service, uh, a telephony service, an email service, uh, like an OTT service. The, the, the law doesn't differentiate, except that if, if it is an OTT type of service, the, the, the um, requirements for tapping into it is, is higher than if it's a cable. So they put that into the law to, to raise the bar for the, the intelligence service to go after the OTT services. So the, the, the owner of the service, the operator of the service, must then mirror the traffic. They're not supposed to stop it or change it or anything like that. They should just mirror it and then serve it out to the intelligence service. So this mirroring is the responsibility of the operator. I'll come back to that in a little moment. And then the, the Secret Service takes over, and they have three production lines, and I'll go through them shortly. Uh, the first one is a technical um, uh, production line that is meant to look at the technical parts of the traffic to interpret protocols, patterns, whatever, that you need to kind of deep dive into the technical infrastructure. So they're only allowed to take snapshots, 30 seconds per hour, and they could keep it for two weeks, and then they have to throw it away. And they're not allowed to use these data for intelligence production. It's only for technical analysis of the traffic itself to make it possible to set up the rest of the system that I'll go into in a, in a second. So th this is, of course, obvious control points for us. Only 30 seconds an hour, only two weeks, uh, and separate from the rest. Um, and it's even in the law specified that it should be separate people. So the people working this part of the system is not allowed to work with intelligence production as well. Could be interesting. I think they will have lunch together. So who knows what they talk about over lunch. We might have to sit at the end of the table. Could be a lot of lunches. Um, so th this is one of the production lines. If we then take the rest, to be able to put traffic into the rest of the production line, they need a court order. This is where the court comes in and has to give them OK before they go for a specific uh, communication link. So the, the picture is a little bit misleading because there will be many arrows out of this mirroring box. And they might have uh, this technical uh, analysis going on for, on many of those arrows and just pick one or two out to have court orders and in, in that way in the production line, but, well, details. But the court order will, will then get into play very early in this intelligence production process. If the court says OK, the first stop of the traffic will be a filtering system to filter out uh, traffic that they're not allowed to look at. Norway to Norway traffic is one of those, those things. Could be others as well according to what the court is specifying. The court might have a long list of, of things they're not allowed to look at. Um, 
And also, they will filter out things that they're not interested in, like Netflix streaming or um, things like that. They will throw that away in this, this first stage. And then for us to be able to go in and control such a filter, we don't know how it will be built yet, uh, but that's something we have to learn. And how efficient will such a filter be? How easy is it to say that traffic from one per or one IP address or one email address to another IP address or email address is between two Norwegian individuals? Could be very hard. So we're um, this is one of the control points that we will use a lot of time to really dive in and see how efficient is it, how much traffic that is actually between Norwegians will pass this filter. There was a case in, in Germany at DKIX Frankfurt. <laughs> they got a court order. They should mirror traffic out and uh, to the Secret Service in Germany. And they, is, they, they anticipated that the Secret Service would only be able to filter out 98% of the German to German traffic. So it's 2% left. And for a big IX, even 2% is a lot of traffic. So there's a lot of information about Germans that would go to the Secret Service. And we might come in a similar situation, but then this is my job or our job then to find out and to, to, to point the finger at it. This is not good enough if it's not good enough. Then when they have filtered the traffic, so they only have what is allowed for them to, to work with, we have the metadata phase, which is a, a filtering system then picking out the metadata from the traffic and storing it in a storage where they can have it for up to 18 months. And then they have some tools to, to work with the metadata. But here the court comes in again, because they're not allowed to use these tools on the metadata unless they have a court order. So they can store it, but not look at it. So to be able to dig in, they have to have a court order. You can imagine this also requires some tools from, from our side to be able to ensure that they're not looking at it. We're not looking, we're not looking, uh, yeah, well, let's see. The, the third and final production line is content, um, where they look at the content of communication, and here they have to have a court order before they store the content. So, so they're not allowed to store content unless they have a court order. And when they have stored it, they can use it as, uh, at will. Um, when it comes to storage, it's 18 months for metadata. After 18 months, they must delete it. Uh, there is one opening, if they have used it for something useful, they can take the useful part out and store it for further use, up to five years. When it comes to content, they can store it for five years, but if it's of interest, they could store it for five years more, or five years more, and five years more, as long as it's of interest. So, this is the system drawn out based on what is described in the law and the work around the law. Uh, and it shows us, kind of, for us, uh, then now scaling up an organization to go in and control this, shows us at least some of the control points and some of the challenges that we need. And wh when we get to know more about this system, we will know more about what kind of competence we need, and etc. So I'm hiring more people uh, <laughs> this year and next year to be able to do this. Um, and one downside is that uh, when, um, when we know more, I can no longer stand here and talk about it because I might say something I shouldn't. So, but we'll, we'll, we'll live with that. So uh, you as operators will be asked to do a number of things here. Uh, and the law says something about uh, selection, filtering, testing, collection, storage, etc. And uh, to translate it, it's mirror and transmit the communication in real time. It will be to provide some technical information about the communication, so they don't have to reverse engineer more than they need to. Um, it's allowed some installation of equipment out there, so they can pick up the, the mirrored traffic, and also assist them in the operations, because uh, the, the intelligence service might not have people all around the country, where, but, but the operators are all over the country, so, so you have to uh, assist them. And also, one very... Uh, important thing for the Secret Service and has been discussed a lot, if you as an operator are in control of some encryption, you should remove that encryption before you send the traffic to the intelligence service. Uh, you're, not, you're not supposed to break any encryption, it's only if you're in control of it. So there was some talk about email encryption earlier today, where you put encryption on emails between email servers. 
then you should, if you have the traffic in clear text without an encryption, you should send it in clear text. But if you are an operator of a, of a DVDM system, you, you give them the, the, the wavelength and they must figure out themselves. Um, <laughs> and then maybe one of the most important parts for the secret service is that all of this should be kept confidential. So if any of you have been contacted, you're not allowed to tell me, or you shouldn't tell me. Uh, I might find it out another way, but that's a different story. But, and confidentiality here makes it more difficult to talk about this, because I cannot go out to operators that I think have been contacted and ask them, have you been contacted? Can we talk about it? So uh, that, that, is, that is difficult. And also operators cannot talk between themselves to, to exchange experience on this subject. So the last thing you will be expected to do and is uh, to uh, send a bill. So if you as an operator have uh, costs doing this, you should be able to send a bill to the Norwegian government and hopefully there's some oil money left to, to, to pay for it. Um, the timeline is that the law is in effect. Uh, there's some small details being ironed out that will be passed in uh, through Parliament this, this uh, first half of this year. So they're, they're testing and, uh, and doing system build-up. There will be um, a revised chapter in the law this first half of this year, and then the law will be complete, and this will go. they will be able to start building the operational part of it, the, where the green bubbles and the court will be in operation and we will be in operation to control it. Um, so that's about it. Um, we'll have maybe time for one or two questions, and uh, I'll be here all day today and tomorrow, so um, grab me if you, you want to. <laughs> Hi. Uh, can you just uh, go back to the, the court order slide and the technical pipelines? So I didn't quite get the first court order uh, I mean, that, that, well, you sort of waved your hand and said details, right? But how many <laughs> of uh, the, the first court order there, what yep. sort of court order? Could, I mean, because we're talking about bulk collection. I, I thought you would put more or less everything into the metadata storage at least. Yeah, well, but, but what is that sort of? Yeah, the first court order. There. Yeah, the per, first one. Per uh, what? Per, per person you want to listen to? Per Fiber, you, you, you think about the, the, the court order closest to the mirroring part? Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be able to let data into the production pipeline, which is the, 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 the first part of the, of the production process, uh, you have to have a court order to let the traffic in. So if you go to an operator and say, hey, give me the communication on this link, they will, be, they, they will get that link and can use it for testing purposes. But to be able to put it into intelligence production, they have to have a court order to, to put it into that part of their, of their equipment. OK, so it will sort of be one court order per link-ish. We don't know. We have, <laughs> uh, there's okay. been no court orders. The system is not operational. Right. So uh, even the law is not finished, so we don't know yet. That, that, but that's a good question, because it might be one court order a month or 15 a day. We don't know. Okay. We don't know the detail level. Okay. And when we know it, I can't tell you either. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but there's probably, probably likely a, a order of, of uh, or many orders sort of of difference here between these. The, the number the, these of These three orders green here. bubbles will be different types of court orders. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and, and uh, second, and maybe you don't know this either, but the mirroring, what, what is this? Uh, I mean, you, you just said about expenses, et cetera, right? But what is that interface technically? I mean, are, are people supposed to hand over like, you know, layer two Ethernet frames, or 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 is it a, a you know passive optical split? Or I mean, are you going to do coherent detection and stuff on your? I, end? I, I you think don't this know. this will depend on the service that they're mirroring. Okay. So because if you're if you're uh, if you're mirroring a DVDM system, yeah. it'll probably be a wavelength. If you're mirroring a, a, an email system, it'll probably be some packets pushed over e Ethernet. Probably we don't know. That, there's also things that we have to learn as we go along. Right. Thanks. Hi. Do you have a timeline for the whole process when it's going to be completed? Uh, there is a timeline, and it's classified. <laughs> <laughs> but what I can say is that it's not operational yet, because the law is not finished. So, right. And the law will be passed probably June this year, so sometimes and after June this year. And you believe in all these things? I mean, Sorry? You believe in all these things? I mean, th this is 
it's going to be doable, feasible? I mean, it seems uh, to be quite from, complex. From a technical perspective, all of this is doable. Okay. Yeah. Uh, if it's useful, uh, someone else will have to answer for it. <coughs> Thank you. But I can say on the useful side, uh, the reports from the UK commissioner that ha oversees this uh, says something about 50% of all uh, terror activity in the UK that has been avoided, has been avoided because of clues collected with a system like this. So someone out there thinks this is very valuable. And uh, when you look at the price tag in Norway, uh, 1,100 million Norwegian kroners, which is quite a lot of money, someone thinks this is useful. So, yeah. Um, in this case, the court orders, filter one, no Nor Norwegian um, connections, Norwegian outside Norwegian. So what happens if you have to add lots of data and it's becoming an avalanche in your system? Huge data. So who is going to take care of this data and take care of the information which is uh, needed to for the intelligence, right? Well, and the second one is when court order coming saying, okay, no, this is not the right case, just close down. How do you handle all of the um, backup systems? Good luck. <laughs> well, to, to, uh, to uh, answer the final question, um, we don't know yet how this system is built. So we'll have to find a way of s uh, ensuring that things are deleted. Uh, when it comes to uh, who's going to care for all the data that comes along, it's the intelligence service that is building all of this. So it's only the mirroring that is uh, the responsibility of the actual provider of the service. They will have to mirror th the traffic, and the rest is uh, for the military intelligence to build, including our control systems. So if we say that we need this system to control this, they will have to build it for us. So uh, that is one of the specification phases we will start with when, when the system kind of grows a little bit more. We will start then designing the control system. And so then I'll stop talking about these things. Who is in charge for, for the data? Is it the intelligence community? or it's it, it, This is the military intelligence service that uses it. Okay. Has well, in that case, GDPR doesn't <laughs> have anything to do with it, right? No, no. Well, I, I don't use these data. I just control that the usage is in, in, uh, in, in accordance with the, the court. All right, last question. I got to... I uh, have a last question. Uh, where can this be used? Can it be used only by the military intelligence? Can it also be used by the police? Uh, is it admissible in court? So the, things like that? The law in Norway is very strict. It is only the military intelligence that are allowed to use it. And they have very limited uh, um, ability to share this information with other services. And it's not admissible as evidence in court. And this is very different from the Swedish FRR login, which now I think it's 17 or 19 different services in Sweden that can, can get data from, from the military intelligence area in Sweden. Uh, and it can be used in court and a lot of things. So in Norway, we're not there yet, but this is one of the big concerns. Would, it, would this move over time? If, if someone thinks that we should also look at this data, will this then slide? Uh, so that is one of the things that the community looks at very, very sharply. So then a follow-up. Is a military intelligence in Norway uh, in charge of reporting on terror? Uh, terror outside Norway. Okay. So, to, so, so if someone abroad is planning terror in Norway, that's their okay. turf. Great. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Shetil. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.